Well, historically, the time period of Lent is a time of preparation, a season of kind of anticipating the, uh, the fin- finality of the life of Jesus and his resurrection. I want to ask you to kind of think back over the course of your life into seasons that have required the most preparation. I mean, if you're really to think about your entire life, what would be those seasons you could point to and say, man, there's a lot of preparation leading up to this moment. Um, you know, I, I think of with, with kids now, I remember my own childhood, all the preparation that went into starting school, like leaving my mom, uh, my mom was blessed to be a stay-at-home mom, and so that, that transition from leaving home and going to school for the first time, and then every year that cycle, you know, getting the backpack, getting the lunchbox, Back then, we had really cool lunch boxes, the tin ones that opened with a lid, right, and had lead paint on them that are probably bad for us. And, and I remember, you know, getting, going out and going school shopping for clothes, you know, and I'd get all these new clothes. Most of them I didn't like, but I got many warnings every day. If I catch you outside in the yard wearing these clothes, you're dead. And I believed it, and so I always changed. But there was an excitement, kind of a terror as well that went with starting school, beginning that new transition in life. It it was exhilarating to think about, but it was also terrifying to consider. Uh, And some days were like that in school as well. In fact, I still have uh, the the, the blanket from my bed when I was in elementary school. I almost brought it with me, but I still have it. It's kind of a keepsake, uh, kind of a uh, a symbolic memory for me, and, and you wouldn't be surprised to see that it says Ohio State on it. So if I had it up here, you'd see it's red and gray. But I just have always kept that. It was just kind of something that was unique uh, from my childhood. There's preparation that goes into the other end of school, too, as you begin to graduate, right? And you move into your first job, or you choose to go to college, or you join the military. I remember when I graduated high school in 1997, I had no interest in exploring college, no desire at all to visit a campus. I was burnt out on school. You know, 13 years of it from kindergarten on is enough for me. I didn't want anything more to do with it. No more homework, no more teachers, no more extracurricular activities. I was done. I wanted to make money. And so I did. I went out and got a job, and, and it was a good job, and I thought I'd just build my life in my hometown and buy a house, have a family someday, and everything would be great, like my dad, who was a truck driver. And I tried it my way for two and a half years, and then eventually I got to the point where I realized I could not resist what what God was calling me to do. Not, not Not that anything he was calling me to do was any better than what my dad had done or anybody else had done, but that vocation that I was trying to pour myself into, I was trying to make that my calling in life when God had called other people into that life, and he was calling me into something different, and so I... I knew he was telling me to go back to college, and so I I began that process of transitioning to go back to college after being out of school for two and a half years, which was a little bit of a culture shock, going back into all the routine of homework and study and all of that. But I remember all the preparations that were required in order to actually get to school and not be seen as someone just visiting campus, but to actually be seen as a student. I had to, to dig out my old ACT scores. Uh, which was scary in and of itself because when I took the ACT as a senior, I did so because my mom told me to, and I was a good firstborn, so I did what mom said, but I didn't study. I didn't prepare. In fact, for the last section of the ACT, I literally went through and just circled dots so I could leave. So my ACT score was terrible, and I was uh, literally, when I finally applied to Mount Vernon Nazarene College, I was like, I don't even know if I'll get accepted here. And then I realized it really doesn't matter what my grades are. They need the money. And so they accepted me. And I was like, okay, cool. So I get to go. Now i got to figure out how I'm going to pay for this thing, right? And so then you meet with the the financial aid department. You fill out your FAFSA and sign your life away and begin that process of preparation there. Met with the advisor. Scheduled my first uh, semester of classes. I came in at the halfway point. So it was there that I met my roommate. And when you come, when you start school at the halfway point, there's not a lot of open beds. And so you're kind of stuck with who you're stuck with. And that's how it was for me. It was a very interesting first semester of school. But I still have the comforter that I bought and all that stuff I had to buy to go to college. I still have the comforter that I had on my bed when I was in college 20 years ago. I still have it. It's in our basement. Sometimes we use it uh, when we're watching a movie or something. And then there's preparation that goes into dating. You know, even more preparation that goes into when you finally say, I'm going to ask this person to marry me or we're going to get married. Then the preparation for a wedding. We don't have time to talk about all those preparations today. We'll move on. But there's a lot of preparation then that goes in when, when we're expecting children, right? I mean, especially in our day and age today. There is so much stuff that, that we have to get in order to feel capable of bringing little human beings home from a hospital, Right? I mean, you've got car seats and cribs and changing tables and swings and pack and plays and a nursery. And I didn't even realize how big of a nursery the deal was and picking out colors and having that conversation and then painting it and not getting it quite right and have to paint it again. 
and then the diapers and the wipes, and you got to get the little thing that warms up the wipes because God forbid your baby gets a cold, wet wipe on its backside, right? And then you got all these clothes that people are giving you and that you're buying, and then you think it's enough because you got six totes of it, but your wife says, no, we need more, and so you go and you spend more. And then there's the picking out of the name, which I think is an, a- an act of God's sanctifying work in us to, to help us learn compromise in marriage, picking out a name. And-, and the very first thing we bought when we knew we were expecting our daughter, Savannah, we actually went to Walmart right here in town, and we bought a baby blanket. It was actually New Year's Eve. We bought a baby blanket just so my wife could have something tangible. Now, I know what you're thinking. Right now, you're thinking, Fetter, you have an extensive collection of very weird blankets at your house, which is true. I might be a little bit of a hoarder, dating back decades, right? Even to my childhood. <clears throat> but isn't it true that we have these tangible things we hold on to that have sentimental value that represent moments in our lives that, that inevitably there was a lot of preparation involved with them, that there was a lot of thought, a lot of, a, a lot of uh, expectation as well, reminders of those moments. Throughout the Old Testament, God would instruct the Israelites to build altars of remembrance after he gave them a significant victory or after they moved into the promised land. And the reason God told them to build these altars is so that they would have a place to go back and tell the story of his goodness and his faithfulness in their life. Build an altar here to remember what, it, what, the, what the God of the, the nation of Israel has done for you, how he's delivered for you, how he's provided for you. Well, we have these other little sentimental things for us, and Lent each year may not be a tangible thing to hold on to, but it's a part of the Christian calendar as a reminder season, the final seven weeks where we prepare. We prepare our souls, we prepare our hearts, we prepare our minds. We even prepare our bodies for the feast and celebration of Easter Sunday at the empty tomb. From before the foundations of the world, God's plan for mankind was centered on the promised arrival and sacrifice of His Son, Jesus Christ, that would pay the penalty for our sin and set us free. I mean, the entire Old Testament is set aside as a nurturing of creation to prepare the ground for the planting of the life of Jesus. I mean, all throughout human history, it's pointing to that moment, all throughout creation, preparing for the, wor- the world for the rescue that was coming in the person of Jesus. And then you jump forward, the final few weeks of preparation before Jesus would walk to Calvary and be nailed to a tree where he will do what he said he's come to do, why his father sent him here in the first place, where what plays out will be what the prophet Isaiah wrote down would happen to the Messiah, but Isaiah wrote it seven centuries before it actually played out. Jesus would even tell us what he's here to accomplish in his own words. And John the Apostle would be there to write it down. In John 3, verse 16, God loved the world so much that he gave his only, his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in Jesus. Let me say that again. Jesus is speaking this. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in Jesus. Sometimes we we rack ourselves with guilt and shame over sins of the past, and we think we're still condemned. It's because we're not living out of our new identity in Christ. He says right here, Jesus, there is no judgment against you if you believe in me. But anyone who does not believe in Jesus has already been judged. We live, we, you stand in condemnation by not believing in God's one and only Son. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, Jesus. But people love the darkness more than the light. Now remember, Jesus is saying this before he'll be crucified. This is early on in his ministry, John chapter 3. Long before the crucifixion, long before the arrest, long before he's even a household name. He says, God sent his light into the world. He sent me into the world. But the people of this world loved the darkness more than they loved the Son of God, more than they loved his light. And their actions were evil. All who do evil, our actions reveal the condition of our heart. When we do evil, we hate the light and we refuse to go near it. For fear our sins will be exposed. I mean, this points right back to Genesis, to the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve wanting to hide in their sin wanting to cling to the darkness and the shadows behind trees, thinking they could hide from God who was calling for them. Lent is this season of kind of intentionally wandering closer to the light 
Kind of intentionally pushing back darkness. It's a season of preparing our hearts to receive Christ. Not the way we would like the King of Kings to come, but the way in which the King of Kings chose to come to die. And so just like you wouldn't show up tomorrow down at SUNY expecting to sit in a class and begin the process of getting your degree without the proper preparations, in much the same way you wouldn't show up here next Saturday just hoping if you're single that your future spouse will show up at the same time and all your families and friends. I mean, there's preparation that goes along with dating and engagement and planning a wedding ceremony. In much the same way, you wouldn't just walk into a doctor's office when you finally start having contractions and you're ready to deliver the baby, but you would have meetings and appointments with the doctors beforehand, measuring and calculating everything. So we should not arrive at Easter Sunday without a time of proper preparation where our souls are like waiting for that celebration. We're waiting for that victory. We're walking with Jesus down his path of self-denial. And we're denying ourselves as well in the process. We're identifying with what Jesus did for us leading to his death. This is what Lent's designed for. You could sum up Lent as kind of a season of kind of breaking free, breaking free from ourselves, breaking free from our routines. Breaking free from the things we enjoy, the things we get pleasure in. Breaking free from our desires or cravings. Even at this time of the year, breaking free from maybe some laziness or apathy that's occurred because we want to stay in and not go outside because it's cold. Even breaking free from some of the things that we often take for granted. Lent's a season of drawing nearer to God. Welcoming the fact that like Jesus says in John 3, because he's light, our sin and shadows will be illuminated by him. So will we walk more closely connected to Jesus where his light can illuminate our sin? Or will we fall into that temptation of trying to hide in the shadows? This is why disciple maker groups are so pivotal. Why Jesus selected three out of the 12 disciples to kind of walk more vulnerably with, more transparent with. We see this time and time again in the gospels. Jesus was a little more honest with those three than he was with the other nine. There was a kindred relationship with Peter, James, and John that didn't exist with the others. And we need those same relationships in our lives where we're committed to not live in hiding anymore, to not stuff things down, but to be transparent and open and vulnerable. And that takes courage. That takes, it takes a holy courage to welcome Lent and choose to draw closer to Jesus, knowing the closer we get to him, the more he's going to expose our sin because he's light. It takes even more courage to look at ourselves in the mirror and face our own shortcomings, our own baggage, our own sin. But it's so worth the journey because that's how we break free. We don't want to live compartmentalized lives where we kind of look at the different areas of our life and we say, okay, this I'll give to God, this I'll trust God with, this I'll surrender, but God, I want this for me. I'm going to do this my way. And and to think that that's not going to impact or infect the rest of our lives is denial. For the history of the church, there's been a number of ways that we can move towards Easter Sunday with greater focus on the resurrection, but two of the most consistent and common patterns for now 2,000 years are prayer and fasting over the next seven weeks leading us to Easter. Last week, Pastor Corey and Pastor Tim kind of primed the pump on this by by what they shared, but today's our last Sunday together, so I want to talk a little bit about both of these. I'll start with prayer. Now, I know the topic of prayer sometimes causes insecurity to rise in many of us, Even you could have been a Christian your whole life. You could have attended church gatherings, worship gatherings your entire life. And yet oftentimes the idea of prayer might lead you to be scared or insecure because of the thought of praying out loud in front of other people. And I understand that. I mean, research tells us that when people's fears are calculated in our culture, one of the highest, strongest fears is people are afraid of public speaking. Talking publicly when other people are around. That means at a funeral, you'd rather be in the casket than the one you're giving the eulogy. That's literally what that means. I'd rather be dead than have to say something at a funeral because death falls lower on, that, on that, those surveys. But oftentimes, the reason we struggle to pray out loud is really because we don't believe what the New Testament says about who God is to us. We are told very clearly by Jesus himself that he... God's his heavenly father, we're his brothers and sisters. That that he's our heavenly father. If we really believe that God is our dad, and that prayer is just an opportunity to, to, to just talk how we normally talk with the dad that loved us enough to run out into traffic for us, to rescue us, then all of a sudden we begin to push aside what anybody else might have to think about that. 
Because it's more about us and our dad than it is about any other person. See, powerful prayers are not measured by the creativity of your vocabulary words in the presence of the almighty God of the universe. Powerful prayers are measured by the the passionate pursuit of a heart that just wants a relationship deeper with dad. And any words you use are powerful because they're soaked in your trust of your dad, in the love of your dad, in your faith in your dad, who just happens to be the almighty ruler of the universe. But the dominant theme of prayer throughout the season of Lent, historically, is not necessarily praying before God and listing a list of all these things you want God to change. Instead, this season, in this season, the emphasis is on confession and repentance. It's focusing on the things that often get in the way of our relationship with God, the walls that, that, that kind of grow in between us and God. The closer we draw to God, the more His light will shine, as John 3 says, and that's going to expose our sin. And so that, that, that exposition of our sin is, gives us an opportunity to kind of begin to confess it to God and repent of it, turn away from it, declare about our sin what God says is true of our sin. You know, there's a little side note about a prayer of repentance seeking forgiveness. If you're a follower of Jesus and you would say you're serious about your walk with God, prayers of repentance and confession should be a regular rhythm in your spiritual life. And if you're like, hey, I don't really know the last time I, I confessed or repented of my sin, then be thankful that you're here today. It's not an accident. God wants you to get into this regular routine and rhythm of constantly asking the Holy Spirit, where is there sin in your life that needs to be confessed? We're going to actually do that in a, in a little bit, give you that time just personally with God. But today as we kick off the Lenten season with, with a fasting and prayer emphasis towards the cross, we're going to be receiving communion together. And, and there's a profound connection between communion, the Lord's table, and, and, and confession and repentance. They're intricately linked. And we actually have something different today for communion than what we normally use. Normally we use bread, you know, typical bread that's nice and puffy and soft and squishy. A lot of times we'll even get the Hawaiian sweet bread, which is like, I'm sure they'll have that in, in heaven. Like it's really, really good bread. And we're not using the good bread today to which you would say, well, then why did I come, right? I mean, it's good bread. Today we have something else. It's, it's homemade unleavened bread called matzah. And it looks more like a wafer or a cookie. It's, it's crisp. It breaks. You can kind of see it in the picture. Made by, by uh, somebody here in our congregation. You may say, well, why? What's the point of using something that kind of looks and sounds and tastes like cardboard? Well, going all the way back to the time of Moses and the Israelites near the beginning of the Bible when God delivered them from Egypt, Egyptian slavery and bondage, and he set them free, and then he led them through the promise, into the promised land through the wilderness, there's, there's some moments in there where God uses leaven in bread as a symbol. Like yeast causes bread to rise, so does leaven in bread cause, cause bread to rise. And he uses leaven as a symbol of sin. And the toxic nature of just this compartmentalized life where we, uh, this is mine and I want to give you all this other God and bless me here and give me your favor, but I don't want to give up this. Moses begins to speak about that. And, and they begin to learn that God is creating a new people. He's creating a nation, a people set apart from this world, that, that as He is holy, His people are to be holy, to live a life of boundaries, of, of agreeing with God what He says is right and what, he, what God says is wrong. And so the, the, at the annual celebration of Passover, pointing everyone back to that moment where they were rescued from Egypt, they would often use bread, they would, as a part of the tradition, use bread without leaven, as a reminder of the infectious disaster that sin can cause in our lives. Jesus would come along much later, and he would use leaven in a parable. He would talk about, in Matthew 13, how in one loaf of bread, just the smallest amount of leaven in the loaf, it, it infects the entire loaf. All of it rises. It's not just like one little part rises, the entire thing is affected. And then in Paul's writings, he draws attention to this as well. Listen to what Paul says to the church as he writes to Corinth. You see this com conversation about leaven and bread all the way throughout Scripture. But in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul says, Don't you know a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch. As you really are. I love that statement Paul adds. So often we can think, you know, if I behave a certain way, I'll change who I am. We think we can behave our way into a new identity. If I do this, I'll become this. What Paul says here, what is so true about the gospel, 
is when you say yes in faith to Jesus Christ, immediately the old is gone, something new is there. A new identity is transformed. You are no longer a child of wrath. You're now a child of God. You're no longer in opposition to God, but you're an heir of His kingdom. Everything belongs to you. And that is instantaneous. And Paul says here, get rid of the old, old yeast. Get rid of the old way of life, those old patterns. Get rid of the compartmentalization. You're living in bondage. You say you've said yes in faith to Jesus. You're saying you have a relationship with Him and let you allow these other elements of your life to continue to exist. And, and it's, it, 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 it's, there's a lack of integrity there. He says, that, that, get rid of the old yeast, the old patterns, and live as you really already are. It means you don't, you don't have to try to live your way into a new identity. It means you've already been redeemed. You've been already rescued. You're already a child of God, so that's who you are. So live out of that new identity. He goes on, he says, for Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. He's not going to be sacrificed again. He's already paid the price. You've already been changed. You've already been reconciled to your dad as his child. That's who you are. And he says, therefore, let us keep the festival of unleavened bread, not with the old bread leavened with malice and wickedness, the evil, the darkness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. He's basically saying, let's live the way God intended us to live, in obedience to him. Not obedience for the sake of obedience, but a whole new kind of obedience. Because God loves us and we love Him and we want to obey His Word. Because we believe His way of life for us shown in His Word is better than any way of life we could live ourselves. I mean, when communion is first introduced by Jesus at the Last Supper, it's really kind of putting a fresh spin on Passover, on this ancient tradition. Because in the same way that God had rescued Israel from bondage to Egypt, and he began to build a nation of his own. It came at the cost of the death of all the firstborn in Egypt. That was Passover. When the Spirit of God passed over, the Spirit of where death passed over Israel, and it took the firstborn of all of Egypt. Jesus would come and he would kind of put a fresh spin on this. The gospel says Jesus, the firstborn Son of God, would pour out his blood and ultimately die. The firstborn would die to set us free to rescue us from the bondage of sin, our spiritual bondage, which was far more severe than any physical bondage to a nation. And in the midst of this rescue that Jesus was accomplishing, he would no longer focus on nation building, but instead, Jesus would build a family that would gather together regularly with one father that he would call his church. And when his church, his children, his brothers and sisters, God's children, Jesus' brothers and sisters would gather, the Holy Spirit would be there and present. And there would be worship and, and there would be prayer together and they would eat together and share meals and fellowship together. They would serve one another and serve those outside of themselves. They would give for one another and give for those outside of themselves. They would give for the expansion of the ministry both locally and abroad. And they would listen to the word of God being taught all of those elements of what it means to be the church gathering are central to who we are and they, those things we do flow out of who we are as the children of God. So communion is this sacramental pattern of self-examination. It helps us get past the wall of unconfessed sin. Communion is designed at a point as a, as a moment to, to kind of sit back and think about what we've done and see where are there places in, the, in our heart, in our behavior that need to be confessed before God before we come to the table of grace. So one huge piece of, of Lent is prayer and the essence on confession and repentance and prayer. And we get more time and opportunity for prayer at Lent because of the other central element of this season over seven weeks, and that's fasting. As Corey said last week, uh, fasting is not a command in the New Testament. Nowhere does Jesus say you have to fast if you're a believer, but in the Sermon on the Mount, he does say when you fast. So he's giving us this idea that it's kind of an expected implication of being a follower of Jesus, that there will be seasons where we will participate in fasting. I don't have this in my notes today, but there's a moment where, where John the Baptist's disciples ask Jesus uh, why his disciples don't fast, and Jesus says, well, when the bridegroom is with you, there's no reason to mourn or be sorrowful. And John the Baptist's ba disciples, baptized, uh, they uh, fasted all the time, whereas Jesus said, but the time will come when I'm removed from my disciples, and they will begin the process of fasting. And so there's this, this idea that's given of an expectation, it's kind of inferred, that when we fast as followers of Jesus, that, that there is some reason, there is some pivotal role fasting has in our spiritual development, spiritual growth. 
but we have to make sure we have an understanding of what fast is, fasting is and what it is not. We've got to make sure we have the right focus on fasting. Fasting so quickly can be the thing we can focus so much on. Oh boy, I'm giving up sugar. Oh man, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I'm giving up caffeine. I'm, I'm giving up lunch one day a week. I'm giving up television or I'm giving up, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm deactivating my Facebook. I don't know what to do with myself. Like we can make the focus of what we're letting go of for 40 days. We can make that the focus, not the one we're pursuing in the place of that thing we're letting go of. See, it's not about, fasting is not about what we want from God. Fasting is more about what God wants for us, what he wants to do in us, what he wants to accomplish for us. And he wants to set us free in every way. In every way, he wants to kind of reclaim what it means to be human, what it, what it means to be how he designed us to be in his image, in his likeness, going all the way back to creation. But some of us might look at fasting and be like, but it's bondage. It's captivity. It may seem fasting is awful, and you're like, I don't even want to consider it because it sounds terrible. I don't want to give up a food, or I don't want to give up something I really enjoy that I get pleasure in, that entertains me. I don't want to give it up. I want you to understand, as we talk about it today, fasting is actually a pathway to greater freedom. It's not a path to greater bondage. Let me illustrate that, and I'm going to use something that all of us probably like in some degree, and that is sugar. So the count of three, raise your hand if you like sugar. One, two, three. Yeah, we all like sugar. Sugar is good. Creamer in our coffee that's laced with sugar, right? Uh, we love cookies and cake and ice cream. And we, we like cookies and cream ice cream. And we like French fries with ketchup. Ketchup has sugar in it. I love fresh cut fries with ketchup. Keep your vinegar to yourself. I don't like vinegar. <laughs> Nothing sweet about vinegar. That does not apply. Um, I was going to have a, a glorious Mountain Dew, a bottle of Mountain Dew with me, because I love Mountain Dew, right? Soda pop. So anyways, there's so many different ways that we, uh, that we um, consume sugar. And one of the weeks of Lent, if you look in the Lent guide that was uh, near your seat, one of the weeks the focus is on sweets and sugar. Um, if you choose to, to go down that road. Um, some of you may have chosen, I know some folks have done that in the past for Lent, for the entire time, kind of going without sugar. And then there's others of us in the room, and you're just like, why would I go 40 days without sugar? Only psychopaths do that. I understand, that's where you're coming from. At first it feels like I, it would be captivity to not be able to eat sugar for 40 days. Because something we love, we enjoy, it tastes good. And we enjoy enjoying it with others. And our cravings and appetites draw us to it. But see, that's what fasting exists for. It, it exists to kind of help us identify that sometimes our decisions are made in the flesh in subconscious ways. We're not actively making our own decisions. But we're letting our body govern our decision making. Whether it has to do with how we spend our time, how we spend our money, or what we put into our body. And the truth is, what fasting begins to bring to the surface is we can become more reliant on substances that have been created than on the substance of the Creator. On our Heavenly Father, on Jesus, on the Holy Spirit. So see, fasting actually helps us to see areas of our lives where we are already in bondage to, we just don't even know it. And you might discover that, that through the process of fasting, even in short doses, maybe a three-day fast or seven-day fast, and we have seven seven-day fasts planned to invite you to participate in throughout the course of this Lent, but you might discover in that short period of time, oh, this is surfacing something I'm actually enslaved to because my desire for it is off the charts. And so we intentionally set aside things that bring us pleasure that are not bad things for a little while for two reasons. One, the discipline can reveal, reveal something that has a grip on us, stronger than the grip of Jesus on us. The second reason we give up things that, that, that bring us pleasure is because as Jesus walked with sorrow to the cross at laying down his life, it's an opportunity for us through Lent to experience his sorrow in a very small way. But to experience the sorrow of not having sugar, or not having caffeine, or not eating food that we like, or, or not watching things on television, or listening to music, or, or whatever. And so we set aside those things for a short time because it's sorrowful. But we also want to live with this discipline that I don't need those things for my ultimate survival. Those won't give me eternity. Jesus Christ alone will give me eternity. He's already promised it. 
God wants us to, to discover the truth that sometimes we're held prisoner to things. And he wants us to experience what true freedom feels like. And to break free from those cravings. The Apostle Paul kind of talks about this, this pursuit of Jesus. And he says this in one of his letters. He says, it's in uh, Philippians. He says, I want to know Christ, the power of the resurrection, participating in his suffering and becoming like him. Lent is a participation in suffering on a very small scale in the comparison of what Christ did for us. But to walk to the cross with sorrow leads us to the feast on Easter Sunday of greater celebration. Because we know the fast has now been broken. We know the bondage of sin has now been broken because of Christ. We know that eternity's gates are now open to us because of Jesus. That He is our hope. He is our joy. And so for 40 days, we experience darker, deeper sorrow as we set aside pleasures we enjoy to walk more closely with Christ. You know, fasting is an incredible spiritual weapon to, in, to identify what's really going on at the heart level of our lives. It identifies what we're reliant on, what we're dependent on, what we think we need. And it begins to surface those things. It's a very profound discipline of self-control. The Holy Spirit will meet us to help us, but it will still require us to make hard decisions when the temptation is very strong to say, no, I'm not going to consume that because I've made a covenant. I've made a commitment to not do it. And when it comes to food, which is so often associated with fasting, the temptation can be, well, I need it to survive. I mean, when it comes to television, radio, when it comes to, you know, social media or, or, or internet browsing or online shopping or when it comes to these other things, we don't necessarily need them to survive. But food, we need to survive. But let's be honest, in our culture and our time, most of us, we eat far more than what we just need to survive. In fact, a lot of what we eat isn't even good for our survival. It's actually doing the opposite to us, Right? Fasting leads us down the path of denying ourselves. That comes up time and time again in Scripture. Time and time again. And part of that is to help discover that at times, we take too much pleasure in food. Even more pleasure than in God. I mean, the Bible calls this gluttony, this pursuit of food, this desire for it. Even as a coping mechanism. And when we deny our body what it wants, even what it needs to survive... In the moment when those cravings take over, we can redirect ourselves, say, no, I don't need that. I need, I need Jesus. I need his grace. I need his presence. I need his promises. I need his forgiveness. You know, this has been a particularly severe flu and cold season, um, hitting a lot of people hard. I know it's hit schools hard and businesses hard. But it's interesting how God designed our bodies to fight infection. For instance, when you get the flu or you get a virus that and there isn't medicine to wipe it away quickly, but, but, but you're told by doctors you've got to go home and you've got to rest. I mean, you've just got to, you've got to let your body fight this. It's amazing what it is we desire in that moment. We desire rest. We want to crash. Our body begins to increase its temperature, causing a fever to fight the infection. And we actually want to, our desire is not to eat, but to fast. I mean, we don't th typically think about it this way. But God equipped our bodies in such a way that when there's an infection, we want to slow down and we don't want to go to the table, we want to go to the bed. When we're sick, we want to withdraw from the world, we want to hide under the covers for days. Our fever rises, it's an attempt to fight the infection, but it also makes our body ache and we just don't want to do anything. There's a, a medical doctor, Rex Russell, who wrote a book called What the Bible Says About Healthy Living. And this is what he tells us, that science is catching up to what God shows us in his word about the value of fasting. This is what he says that, that science is showing us. It's almost as if God designed our bodies to heal themselves at the level of the cells. These healing processes use proteins, carbohydrates, and fats to gain calories and nutrients. Yet each of the ways these substances are utilized in our body produces waste products. The cells we have have built-in ways to clear out this waste, and apparently at times they can be overloaded. Fasting helps unclog our system and eliminate poisons. It's encouraging to know that the same God who designed the discipline of fasting designed our bodies to be benefited by periods of abstinence from food. 
He goes on to say, basically, when our body is infected with disease, we're forced to slow down, and fasting is a necessary requirement to clean out the poison in our body. We don't want to eat. The thought of food even makes us nauseous when we have a virus. And that's God's design for how we fight it. It's interesting. See, Lent is this season where we recognize the greatest infection to us is sin. And we need to slow down our busy lives and pursue Jesus more intentionally. I mean, fasting has a long, impressive history as a discipline adopted by believers for a variety of reasons. Reasons that now even science and fitness and medical knowledge is actually coming to support and encourage. I mean, intermittent fasting is even a new thing about building muscle. But it's further confirming the truth that the way God shows us to live in his word is the best way to live. Jesus himself says it. He says, I've come to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. If we would just choose to obey what he's always, already shown us in his word, to live within certain boundaries and to practice certain things. So I'm going to invite the, uh, the band to come up. They're going to prepare us as, they, we're, as we, uh, we're going to sing Blessed Assurance as we prepare our hearts for communion this morning. Um, you know, central to any fast is self-denial. Saying no to those carnal cravings that we all experience. And prayer is central to fasting. Specifically, prayer through confession of our sins before our Savior. And we can confess our sins because we know that God is faithful to forgive us when we confess. We know that, that God is, is a God of forgiveness. And so his kindness to forgive our sin actually empowers us to want to confess it. His kindness leads us to repentance because we know that he's faithful to his word. And when we confess these sins, we already don't stand in judgment because we believe in Jesus Christ. The only question is, do you believe in Jesus Christ as your savior? Do you believe in him? That, that's the only gateway to, to forgiveness for sin. You cannot do enough to earn God's forgiveness. It's a gift given because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. I'm going to invite you to just kind of sit there just silently and don't participate in the singing yet. They're just going to sing a couple of verses of Blessed Assurance. Allow the words to kind of wash over you and just spend a few moments and just ask the Holy Spirit if you have the courage. God, is there sin in my life I need to confess? And then begin to confess it. It might be very specific in nature. It might be something over the last week of your life. It might be something that's a little more broad and it's just kind of this attitude you've been carrying or maybe it's been a while and you're like, man, I haven't confessed sin in months or years. And now you're at the place before the feet of Jesus and he's inviting you. Humble yourself. Confess that you're a sinner. Be restored. Have that wall of unconfessed sin removed so that when you come forward to receive communion and take that unleavened bread, as a symbol of a life without sin, and you dip it into the juice, you remember the body and blood broken for you. They're going to sing a couple verses, and then we'll stand and pray, and I'll invite you forward to receive communion. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory dear. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood, perfect submission. if you would just stand with me as we pray the lights are going to come down and we're just going to have this time of celebrating communion and celebrating the wall of that separates us from God being broken down because of Jesus Lord God we thank you we thank you we thank you we thank you 
for making a way when there was no way. We know we could never cover our own sin. We couldn't wash it away. The stain is too deep. And so we thank you for what you've done in Jesus Christ to wash away the stain through faith. We believe, God, that you and you alone are the Son. You, Jesus, are the Son of the living God. The Messiah promised to reconcile us to our dad. We commit these elements today, Lord, the matzah and the juice, as symbols of your body and your blood, your body broken and your blood poured out as we take and receive it. May we remember the significance of the gift you've given us, God, and the cost of what it took to set us free, to bring the victory. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.